Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Welcome in. Rob Black and your money. I'm Rob Black. Talking all things financial, money, investing, and more. I like to start Mondays off with a year to date. I don't know why. Something I started doing last year, and it seems to be about the right idea. I think 2021, it felt like I was starting every show off with, oh, market's at a record high. So last year's markets marched lower. I had to come up with something. So let's keep up with it. Bitcoin's up 28% year to date. Woo-hoo! NASDAQ up 6.66%, the sign of the devil. We'll be, come back to that in just a minute. S&P 500 up 4.5%. Dow Jones Industrial Average up 3.5%. The 10-year Treasury sits at 3.5%. A lot of 3.5% there and 4.5%. So NASDAQ up 6, 6.6%, 6. S&P up 4.5%, Dow up 35 Last year is flipped. Last year was the Dow that was the best performance. NASDAQ was the worst performer. I mentioned the NASDAQ up 6.66% sign of the devil. One of the very first R-rated movies I ever saw was Damien. Was called Omen? What was it called? Damien Omen 1? I guess it probably was just Omen 1, right? And uh, he was the devil's child, right? (laughs) He had the mark of the devil, 666 on his head. And all I remember was... That freaked me out because it was something my brothers showed me. My big brother showed me. Anyhow, anyway, do you remember your first R rated movie question? Markets were closed for MLK Day yesterday in the United States, but they were hopping all around the world. Britain and Europe stocks closed higher in both France and Germany. In the UK, the blue chip FTSE 100 index nearly matched a record high it clinched in 2018 as investors continue to get hope from signals that global inflation is beginning to ease now on one hand we're seeing more than half the components in an index that the federal reserve look at are showing signs of deflation on the other hand we're also getting a lot of stock market guru talk like dr doom norio rubini who's been more wrong than right on his predictions in his lifetime, but he is a voice of the extreme. And I think it's important to have that. I would not do what he has to say. I would moderate it somewhere in the middle, but I would hear it just in case I need to know it. He thinks the Fed's going to whip out on its inflation fight. He believes the Fed needs to raise rates past 6% to bring inflation to target levels, but it's unlikely to go that far due to recession risk. He said gold is the best bet for investors as inflation, high debt, and extreme volatility are set to batter the economy. Very interesting. That's an extreme. He's saying extreme, deep recession. Inevitable. But he also said the Fed's going to wimp out. And I think a lot of people on Wall Street think that's the case as well. Elsewhere, um, Elon Musk heads to court over a Tesla tweet. Elon Musk regularly gets into spats over his tweets. He seems to enjoy it so much that he bought the platform, but he's probably less enthused about the legal trial starting today from one tweet in 2018. In it, Musk, who never met a 420 reference he didn't like, said he had secured funding to take Tesla private for $420 a share. And investors are suing Musk and Tesla since the deal had never happened. So far, Musk is expected to testify this week, and his odds don't look great. The judge already determined that the tweet was false and reckless, and now a jury will weigh whether Musk knew it was false and whether it was material to investors. Um, It could be a bad year for Tesla's CEO. We've seen that his $40 billion investment in Twitter is probably worth half that already. The building in New York that houses Twitter employees has cockroaches and is getting gross and out of control. Um, and the competition looks for real, for real in electric vehicles. Toyota is going to invest 35 billion in electric vehicles. They're a little bit late. Their hybrids are lovely. I have a Toyota hybrid. They introduced us to the Prius in 1997, which sold millions and millions and millions of cars. And for some reason, they never really, they they think that the world markets are going to hit EV needs, not at the same time. So they haven't put as much up front as other companies. Like GM, they just unveiled their new Chevy Corvette E-Ray hybrid sports car. 
starting at $104,000. The first ever electrified Corvette will be available later this year. The 2024 Chevy Corvette E-Ray Hybrid will be the quickest production version ever of the American sports car. Eh, eh. I don't know. I'm not a muscle car kind of guy. But it's going to be able to go from zero to 60 in two and a half seconds and a quarter of a mile in 10.5 seconds. That's pretty crazy, right? 10.5 seconds, a quarter of a mile. Um, sounds like there's going to be some dead people on the side of the road at some point. I know, I know. Speed's been around for a long time. I get it. Anywhere and elsewhere out there, Apple has announced new Macs. It can be purchased with either M2 Pro or M2 Max chips. This is, it sounds like an announcement, right? But what it really is, these were due at Christmas time and they couldn't get enough of them made. So they delayed the introduction to the first part of this year. This is not going to be a glorious quarter for Apple. As an Apple shareholders, it is expected to be the worst quarter for Apple in the past five plus years. Because demand slipping during a holiday season where it was tough to get components to put together expensive product that people wanted, they weren't able to meet the demand. And on top of it, we're now at the point where some people are going to chicken out because they hear Noriel Rubini say a big recession's coming. Be ready. Those are some of the top stories of the day. Elsewhere, I want to come back to the Elon Musk, but later, later. I want to come back to the artificial intelligence. Um, Chat GPT has been criticized for not being human enough, but it's going to be a big year for chat GPT and artificial intelligence. You're going to see a lot of IPOs come out. To me, that seems like a no brainer. You're also going to see the art world. Um, You've seen your photo for your Twitter profile or your Facebook profile take over by a cartoony making camera that's using artificial intelligence to make you look kind of cool, cool. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a big year for artificial intelligence. That's all I'm gonna say for now. Just be careful with the IPOs because everyone's gonna want them, and there's gonna be a lot of demand, very little supply, and people are gonna overpay. Um, buying a home 18 months ago, I overpaid uh, because there was a lot of demand and very little inventory, and I knew I was overpaying, and I'm okay with that. But is it ideal? Not for most people. 800-516-1220 to each calls on the air. Anything that you want to talk about, we can talk about money, investing, and more. We're looking at a lower start today. There's negative bias. The S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Dow are all up nicely, as I started the show off with. Earnings reports from Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Silvergate Capital, and Citizens Financial are receiving mixed reactions from market participants. I saw... Um, Goldman Sachs say this was a pretty darn horrible quarter. It's worst earnings miss in a decade as revenue falls while expenses rose. Um, Earnings season is going to be a story for 2023, unlike it was in 2022, because when we were worried about inflation and recession in that order, this year we're going to be worried about recession and earnings following in that order. Don't think the market's put in its bottom just because we've had a good first two weeks on Wall Street. Invest as if you have a time frame of 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial. Don't want to work forever? Check out the Retirement Planning Guide on robblack.com. That's robblack.com, powered by EP Wealth. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Artificial intelligence is going to be a big, big story in 2023 from an investment standpoint, but also a headline standpoint. Three artists are suing Midjourney Stability AI and Deviant Art for their use of AI art generating tool called Stable Diffusion. The artists, Sarah Anderson, Kelly McKernan, and Carla Ortiz, alleged the tool violates millions of artist copyrights. Stable Diffusion has been fed billions of images scrapped from the web in order to train AI on how to do things like identify an avocado. So when a user types Corgi eats avocado in space into an AI art generator, it creates works based on images that it's analyzed. And that brings up the derivative. Is it a derivative 
or is it plagiarism? It's going to be an interesting year. And the lawyers are going to make some money is something I'm going to tell you. Don't we always kind of expect the lawyers to make some money? A new cool technology says, watch out, Zeus. I know you're saying Zeus. Are we talking Greek mythology here? Yes. Scientists have completely mastered lightning. We are now able to use lasers to shoot into clouds and redirect lightning towards lightning rods, which is a pretty big improvement because the lightning safety technologies really haven't been updated in over 300 years. Benjamin Franklin invented lightning rod 317. He'd be 317 years old. So let's guess 300 years ago, he might've invented it 290, maybe. But lightning causes 4,000 deaths a year and billions of dollars in damage. And we can now push lightning strikes with laser pulses. Only problem is you got to have $2 billion to make the experiment technology. I don't know. Is that a story or is that not a story? I get the feeling you're going to be mad at me for you for bringing that one up because you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's going to buy that. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Um, the Fed and being a bird watcher. Um, a lot of news came out over the last four days. Some of it I got to on my last show. Some of them I did not. The Fed's getting hawkish. Last week, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic and San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly both suggested that the central bank will need to raise interest rates to somewhere above 5% to ease inflation. It ain't over till the fat lady sings or Jerome Powell sings. And that's going to be the story of the year. We're waiting to see a break. Bed Bath & Beyond is closing roughly 150 stores to save half a billion dollars. That's $500 million. The chain has been struggling for years. All those 20% off coupons are more likely double text from a desperate ex rather than a sound retail strategy. I don't even know. Um, to me, in the 1990s, when I was in my 20s, in 30s, let's just say, we can blend that over a couple, a couple years. Bed Bath & Beyond was great. I thought the way to score a woman's thumbs up was to have throw pillows. What guy has throw pillows on his bed, right? So I'd go to Bed Bath & Beyond and get throw pillows. I'd get nice bedding. Um, couch was gross and disgusting. TV was nice. Like, Do you remember your 20s and 30s and things you diverted money towards and not? Bed Bath & Beyond had a great 1990s as an investor. Fantastic. One of the best I've ever seen. They went through, at least at one point in time, 24 straight quarters of beating expectations. And you're like, that's six years? Yeah. Yeah. Housing and putting stuff in houses was a business. Now, with Etsy and all the other various choices, not so much. Bed Bath & Beyond, in the last five, 10 years, if I wanted something like a soda stream... That day, and I didn't have time for Amazon to deliver it tomorrow. Maybe? I have not been in a Bed Bath & Beyond in at least five years. And that tells me something. They're big stores. I don't like big stores. As I got older. It looks like a football field inside of it. And um, they're, they're pretty empty. And yet the parking lots are pretty full. It's just not my shtick, but they're looking at bankruptcy. Then I brought that up. Here's my thoughts on bankruptcy real quick. I'm okay with bankruptcy. I understand it. It's part of the law, and I think companies should use it to their betterment, especially if they have shareholders. I know you're saying, oh, you liberal. No, I, I just think the law is there for, for your safety and protection. If laws say you can do it, you should be able to do it. I'm very non-opinionated when it comes to interpreting law. I know that's going to get me in trouble, right? House Republicans voted to defund the IRS, ostensibly rescinding the agency's $71 billion in funding from the Inflation Reduction Act. This is an ostensibly because it has to get through the Democratic-led Senate and probably won't. Texas Representative Dan Crenshaw, who got into a big hullabaloo. Do you remember a couple of years ago on Saturday Night Live when Pete Davidson kind of talked about the, the guy in Congress who had the eye patch and he looked like Snake Pisklin? 
from yeah, and it's like whoa and then the guy got mad and was he making fun of him and pete davidson apologized and pete davidson had him on the air yeah that dan crenshaw he argued that the average american cares about defunding eighty-seven thousand irs agents seems like the average american cares about making a seven dollar box of cereal last for three weeks in his opinion but each their own hmm. i don't know if i agree with republicans on this one on Defunding the IRS is a good idea. I don't know. You know, I dated an IRS agent, which is a pretty interesting quick story. Um, the IRS recruits really, really smart people, and she was a really, really smart person in college. Um, and she did a pretty good job, it sounded like, when we were talking about like her collecting on wealthy people. I don't really have the politics for understanding this, so I'm just going to pass on it and just say it's it's out there. You decide. Um, but I will say this, pay your taxes. And I do think states like California and the federal government and New York, both very, very Democratic states, have to figure out something about companies that are started in California and then say, you know what, we're moving to Texas where there are no income tax. Like there's, there's something wrong about that. Again, totally the law. And I already said the segment I believe in, let the law interpret the law and everything will fall into place, right? But uh, it seems odd to watch money shift around like that. I know some financial planners that are completely, completely leaving the state that they earn money in to go to states where they don't pay taxes in because they taxes are an important part of financial planning. And I can't say I'm judgy on it because like I said, if the law is law, it's law, law, it's law. Do I think something needs to be done? Kind of. Anyhow, and anyway, you can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Thanks for listening to the show. Got a big seminar coming up. Listen to commercials. It's coming up in February. Sign up starts today. Just find me on robblackshow.com. You are listening to the Rob Black Show podcast. For more information on EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. In some odd news around the world, China's population declined in 2022 for the first time since the early 1960s, and India is poised to overtake it as the world's most populous country soon. A lot of thoughts on that, right? As far as a headline goes, should you have investments in India? Because the argument is, should you have investments in China based on how many people live there and how many people consume vehicles, whether they be bicycles or cars or food or travel or gambling? You can make a case that there's a lot of people doing very few things. And when that happens, there's a volume, 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 a concentration on companies. Um, I've never been to China. I've been to India. I got to say, I find them very tough countries for me to interface with because I am very, very Americanized. Um, But India is overtaking China's most populous country soon. I did a story on India versus China 25 years ago where I talked about how India was a better long-term investment than China because they have a more open society, better colleges, better roads, better healthcare, better banking. I don't know if that's still true. So here's where I am with that. Yeah, I do think you want international in your portfolio. Uh, Man sent me an email over the weekend and asked me, you know, what should my allocation be? I said, a little bit of large cap, a little bit of mid cap, a little bit of small cap. Those are three verticals. Large, mid, small, a little bit of income, a little bit of growth. Those are the horizontals. And you can own one of each. That makes them six. But then you need to add some international and you need to add some income. That's not just value. Value typically has income, but I think you should have some focused income. And you shouldn't be ashamed of your portfolio underperforming the NASDAQ if that's the case. You shouldn't be ashamed that your portfolio might underperform Apple. Um, that's how you allocate to diversify. In my opinion, that's how you start. And then my advice to him was, this is not investment advice. And my further advice was you may want more large cap than small cap to cut down on your growth profile. You may want more income or value than growth to cut down on your risk profile. I don't know you. That's the basic idea. So I'm talking about weird headlines, right? Yeah, I do think India 
is investable. And I would go with an ETF or a mutual fund that has a track record. I would look at that track record and see how you feel over if it's 10 year period, a 10 year period. You'll probably see some ups, you'll probably see some downs, but is it trending up? If it is, the likely it might be the answer to your question is, yeah, I'm okay with underperforming the growth indexes, but this gives me diversity. The Belfer family, man, they seem like a snake bitten family now. It's a New York oil dynasty. They're known for their philanthropy, not necessarily their investments. But they've also been known for some of the worst investments of all time. They've invested in Enron. They invested in Bernie Madoff. They invested in FTX. What do you do when you have all that money? You diversify. Sometimes you diversify a little too much into alternative assets. I'd be looking at that and saying that's a, that's a lesson. Taliban officials are buying blue checks on Twitter. I don't even know what to make of that. Let's just say, whoa. Other big headlines of the day, the world has created $42 trillion of new wealth since 2020, but you probably didn't see a big chunk of it because 63% of that money went to the richest 1%. You're going to hear a lot of congressmen and women advocating for steeper taxes on the wealthiest as the world's most influential people arrived in Davos to ski this weekend, try to solve all the world's problems, the charity uh, noted that for every $1 of new wealth earned by a person in the bottom 90%, a billionaire managed to snag $1.7 million. So that's the Oxfam report on wealth created in the world. It should have you perplexed. I'm a capitalist. I believe that if the rules are the rules, that's fine. You can make a billion or a trillion or a zillion. I hope somewhere along the line you get that Bill Gates giving pledge a thought and think about how all that kind of wealth can help the world. But again, I kind of play by the rules of where they are. And I don't really like when the United States government, the European governments, the Asian governments start saying, okay, we're like in China. Um, you become a billionaire and suddenly you become a target of you need to redistribute some of that wealth to your fellow citizens in China. And that can be a little bit bit scary. Alibaba's CEO disappeared for a few years and he only recently resurfaced. And you're like, what happened with that Chinese tennis player? What 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 was going on there? And you're like, I don't know. But I don't like it when lawmakers get involved after the fact. But again, mm. Mm. I, know that, I know that's a little tough one for people to digest, right? I think so. HBO has a hit on their hands, and it's not the Sex in the City new season. Ah, nope. It's The Last of Us. It's taking place in a nightmarish apocalypse. Audience seem to love it. 4.7 million viewers tuned in to watch the video game adaption, which is for the record, Sony makes some of the best video games of the war in the world. And <clears throat> The Last of Us Part One and Part Two are considered two of the top five, maybe ten video games ever created. Um and they got the original writer, creator of that video game to work on the show. So it seems like HBO snagged the right person to do a, an adapt adaptation. Viewership data is based on Nielsen figures. They're going to grow because it's a pretty darn cool show. The first episode was called When You're Lost in the Darkness, the second biggest premiere episode for HBO since 2010's Boardwalk Empire. That seems like a weird show to remain unbeatable for over a decade. Recall that this was back before the launch of HBO Max or its predecessor, HBO Now. And it was off the heels of The Sopranos and ended, and we wanted another mafia show. According to HBO, Sunday night viewership accounts for 20 to 40% of a show's total audience. So that number's going to grow for The Last of Us. Um, Premier viewership is slightly higher than House of Dragons and Game of Thrones, which debuted to 4.2 million viewers, Game of Thrones, in 2011, before steadily exploding in viewership over the course of its run. The Last of Us lead actors, I thought, were pretty well cast, Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey. 
Bella Ramsey was oddly enough in another HBO show called Game of Thrones, where she played a little seven year old queen who was not afraid of the night walkers and went to battle against them and basically called everyone who was scared of them a little coward. Um, and she used some more colorful curse words that I can't repeat here, but it was one of the greatest scenes ever in Game of Thrones. Same person. Um, the Last of Us have managed to nearly double the season two premiere numbers uh, for Euphoria, which debuted last year. Um, so it's a hit. It's a hit. And uh, again, it shows you, hey, let's just switch the conversation from PlayStation has some really great games. Um, and I'm looking at you, God of War, which will eventually be made into something, right? Whether it be a movie or a TV show. Um, you play the games, you get attached. There's this big Norse dude who was a Spartan fighting the gods, and he's got a son, father-son relationship, and a dead mother. Made for TV drama. But when you get a 14-year-old Ellie um, being led through a, kind of an interesting world, it's an apocalypse world based on mold and fungus, or is it? Or are they zombies? What are you? I'm not going to spoil it for you, but if you played the games, you know. Um, amazing cast, so it's big. So it's not going to be a big financial breakout hit when you have Nico Parker, when you have Anna Tor of Nick Offerman. You've got quite a cast. Um, but the critical acclaim on it was pretty solid. And I guess you could say it's a feather in the hat for HBO and investments in HBO and HBO Max. And they just recently raised their prices, a skosh. But then you look at Disney, and what did Disney do this weekend? On Monday Night Football, a day after HBO premiered The Last of Us, they debuted The Mandal Mandalorian 3 um, coming up on Disney. And it's a, it's not a spoiler alert because it's in the preview. If you don't want to hear, turn off the radio. Yoda's back. I know you're saying, guess who's back? Yoda's back. Baby Yoda. So Disney's like trying to say, uh-oh, they got some good content. We better show up what we got coming in March to get you excited about. Just throwing it down there for you. Elsewhere in the world of cool things, and I, I refer to The Last of Us drawing 4 million people as cool. The General Motors re released the Chevy Corvette E-Ray hybrid sports car, $104,000. I think this is a double bad news, triple bad news. Elon Musk cut prices of some Teslas last week 20%. So if you had just bought a Tesla three months before, you're pissed off. If you have a Tesla and want to resell it, you're pissed off because the resale value just went down. So we're angry at Elon, right? But on top of that, he's got a court case that's starting this week in, in uh, California that he tried to move out of California because it's too liberal and the courts are probably going to side with him. But then on top of it, he gets competition from... Corvette, seriously? That's a good one. That's a good competitor. That should push things forward. But on top of it, the Twitter offices in New York are now infested with cockroaches because he's fired the cleaning staff. Lovely. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Big seminar coming up. Sign up at Rob Black Show. Com. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archive podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money investing and more. Thanks for listening to the show. It's going to be a pretty interesting year for artificial intelligence. You've already heard about chat GPT. I'm sure in the last couple of weeks, you're seeing, well, first of all, Microsoft ponied up $10 billion to invest in the technology and the platform. It's a pretty darn cool search engine, but it's also pretty darn cool, you know, uh, essay writer, if you're in ninth grade and you have to write a book report due tomorrow morning. And let's say you're going to do Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, you can ask ChatGP right me a two-page summary about Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire on a ninth grade level. Notice he's up in it from eighth grade level to ninth grade level. And it can do it. And in some cases, it looks a lot more human. In some cases, it looks a little bit off. Um, I saw one example where 
you asked chat gp what happened on january 6 2020 in the united states and it or 2021 and it, it came out with a pretty good summary and it you asked for a two paragraph summary it comes out with a two paragraph summary it's the ultimate search engine um, name three italian restaurants are perfect for a first date it's gonna scour everything it can it's gonna look at reviews from every restaurant out there and uh there's one in little italy that'll the waiters will sing love songs to the the girl that you bring to the table and that'll make her swoon You're like that's the one i want so nick cave who i don't know who he is but he's an australian musician he says a chat gp song written in his style sucks and is a grotesque mockery of what it is to be human so we're gonna hear a lot of stories about this this year my advice to you is there's going to be ways to invest in it. There's going to be pure play IPOs. There's no doubt about that. There's going to be companies that <clears throat> switch what they're doing to focus on AI. We're looking at Google. If ChatGDB does such a good job of search results, we're looking at Google. What are they going to say in their earnings report? What do they got up their sleeve? Because they're losing. They're taking the L in Europe right now on how they're trying to replace cookies with other types of cookies so that they can serve up better advertising results to their advertising partners. Award-winning oh, musician Nick Cave said a Jet GPC song written in his cell sucks. He wrote in his newsletter that he didn't share some of his fans. He didn't, uh, what did he say in, in his newsletter that he didn't share some of his fans' enthusiasm for the tech, ah, for the technology. OpenAI's chatbot has been praised and criticized for the ability to write any human-like behavior. You're going to hear more and more. And then you see companies like Microsoft say, we're going to put a $10 billion chip in. That's a pretty big chip. It's funny because in Australia, in Australia, you just say, oh, all right, all right. Um, I don't know if he would work in the United States. He's kind of got a receding hairline. He's got long hair. He's got crazy bushy eyebrows. I know you're saying you're you're judgy, Rob. I kind of am, just as far as what what singers should look like. I've kind of got some cliches in my head. Um, and his final quote that is is worthy of throwing down because I think this is newsworthy. I do because I know some of you are going to make a mistake and want to invest. And I've already got an investment in Chat GDP. Because I own shares of Microsoft. You see what I'm saying? Chat GDP may be able to write a speech or an essay or a sermon or an obituary, but it cannot create a genuine song. It could perhaps in time create a song that is on the surface indistinguishable from an original, but it'll always be a replication. I'm going to say this is where Nick's wrong. I'm going to say by the end of this year, we're going to be subscribing to newspapers that can write full sports recaps of what happened with the San Francisco 49ers on Saturday. It's not that hard. It's a formula. And if a computer is able to copy a formula from a college textbooks. First, you say the score, then you get a quote from the coach at the end of the game. I'm going to say that you're not going to be able to tell the difference between some of the news stories from Reuters and some of the news stories from chat GPT. And if I was a young sports writer, I would be going out and buying some depends because your career is about to change. Now, again, I'm, I'm being a little bit dramatic there, but not really. We've seen robots already come and go and disrupt industries like McDonald's. I was on a road trip, I believe, to L.A. maybe five years ago, and I had never seen how automated. I think I went into like a Wendy's for the first time in like 10 years. And the kiosk has these beautiful Coca-Cola signs and these, yeah, you grab a cup and everything is, it's pretty darn intuitive. It's pretty darn easy to see the kiosk replace a human being. Which kind of stinks because... Part of the way I used to date when I was 16 years old was maybe to go into a McDonald's and flirt with a girl behind the counter. Now I got to flirt with Rosie the Robot? No, thank you. Oh, boy. So, yeah, robots have already started replacing jobs. There's a 
robot in Las Vegas, there's Google's got some self-driving cars. And I tried to order one last time in Vegas and I, it, the wait was too long. So I don't know what that tells you about the fleet or the readiness of it, but I wanted to take a robo taxi. I think we've all had experiences with taxi drivers whose breath is offensive, whose attitude is, we're not going to talk to you, who you feel a taxi driver, you're taking us the wrong way. So that led to companies like Waze, who came up with better mapping technologies, which led to companies like Uber and Lyft using companies like Waze mapping technologies to get people to show, hey, here's a non-taxi driver, taxi driver, who's not going to be rude to me, you know, who's going to be nice to you and offer you candy. And he's going to show you the direction that you're taking. What's next? Self-driving cars? Yes. We are have them in some places in the United States. Just letting you know, think about your future. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. And be careful with artificial intelligence investing, please. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.